This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is November 27th, 2000. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Anthony Newsom. Anthony, Tony, we're going to call you. Great. Everybody but your mother calls you Tony, <laughs> as I understand it. Absolutely. Very glad to have you here. Thank you. Can I ask you how old you are? I'm 53. 53, and your current address? In uh, Framingham, Mass. In Framingham, and I understand you w at one time lived in Natick, is that correct? Yes, yes, I lived on West Central Street for a long time when I was fundraising for the paralyzed veterans here in, in this very area. Uh, and one night I had a, I had a pretty serious flashback, and they ended up calling the Natick police. And Tell us. Tell us what a flashback is, Tony. Uh, it's it's hard it's hard to relate that. It's when your mind goes back to a time when when you were in combat, and although you can you can physically see that that it's not there. There's nothing you can do to change the fact that you're there, that you're back. You're back in, in combat again. You're back in the jungle. And you had one of these episodes while you lived in Natick? That's correct. And what was the result of that? The result was that the, the Natick police were, were nice enough to take me to the Brockton Veterans Hospital where I stayed for six months and I was released into a doctor's care and I got an apartment in Framingham after that. But that was the reason uh, that I started my whole process of, of getting my disability increased because of the things that, that had happened to me in Vietnam. The police were astute enough to recognize what was happening to you? Yes, sir. That's good news. And we'll get back to that in a couple of minutes, but sure. I'm glad we started that way. Uh, what, what is your current mar marital status? I'm single. Uh, I've been divorced for 30 years. Okay. Was, can I ask you, was that a result of, of your service? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, she's a wonderful gal. I have a beautiful daughter, 31, uh, who's getting married this May. Good. Uh, Good. My, my former wife and I have always been friends, but I was very immature, very hostile, and very aggressive when I first got out of the Corps, and that's when we were married. Where were you born, Tony? I was born in Roxbury, in Boston. Okay, and raised there for, yes. for how long? I lived there for 16 years until I joined the Marine Corps. Boy, I'm going to ask you in a minute if you joined the Corps at 16. I was 17 and 37 days when I joined the Corps. Okay. What was, what was growing up in that time when there was a war on? Were you in school uh, thinking about getting into service? There was, there was no war on when I was growing up. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in the, in the mid-50s, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was peacetime, it was Eisenhower, and you know, everything was fine. And uh, there was no conflict. And I joined the Marine Corps because I was tired of being a perennial student in the ninth grade. What did your, tell me about your mom and your dad. Uh, my dad, my dad left when I was about five months old. Okay, uh, so you never knew him? And I never knew him. Uh, and about, what, what about your mother? My mom. My mom worked as a homemaker, a housekeeper, uh, for a couple of Jewish families in uh, Brookline, and uh, we collected AFDC. Were you an only child? No, I have a sister, an older sister. You have an older sister. And you were in school, and you were there, and you had difficulties there? Uh, we all had difficulties in, in where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I never thought school was particularly important, so I didn't go a lot. And uh, 
after my third failing year in the ninth grade, I decided that I'm, I'm better suited to be doing something else. And what year was this, Tony? That was in 64. I, I dropped out of school in 63, late 63. And you mentioned a moment, moment ago that you uh, joined the Corps. You joined the United States Marine Corps when? June of 64. June of 64. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? Because they were the ones that would take me. Uh, did you try other services first? The Air Force wouldn't take me because I didn't have a high school education. And the Marine Corps was the next recruiting office. In the, in the block of recruiting offices. <laughs> well, that's how big, big decisions are made. <laughs> <laughs> Had I known then, I might have changed it. I certainly wouldn't change it now. Did anybody else join the Corps with you? That is, uh, any guys from school or any of your neighbors or anything? No, sir. Did you talk about other people, uh, with other people, about going into the service? No. With your mom? No. Uh, any of your people at school? No. You just wandered downtown one day and said, I'm going to join the Marine Corps? Well, I, I went downtown knowing that I was going to join the service. Uh, and I didn't particularly care which service. But I had to get out of Roxbury. And my only way of getting out of Roxbury I felt was to join the service. And let's see, this is June of 64. You joined the United States Marine Corps. Did they send you to Paris Island? Yes. Uh, Want to tell us about that place? <laughs> it's the uh, It's the toughest 13 weeks you'll ever have in your life. And, and you were there in full midsummer. Yes, sir. What was it like? Did you get off the train and took, took the barge over, or the train took you to Port Royal or Yamasee? I got, I got off the train in Yamasee, South Carolina, and I was a kid from the streets in Roxbury. I had on my spade shoes and my tight black pants and my little stingy brim tie. And the DIs were glad to see you. And a camel cigarette hanging out of my mouth. And the DI came over and just whacked the cigarette out of my mouth and told me, you know, you'll smoke when I tell you. And I just, I knew that we weren't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you sure weren't in Roxbury anymore. <laughs> That's the beginning of 13 weeks, and you were a kid with, uh, what, ninth grade education, going into the United States Marine Corps, and certainly Vietnam was uh, a very big part of your horizon. Can you tell us a little more about boot camp and what kind of training you got there? Uh, the, training, the training was something that I had, I had never experienced that kind of discipline. You know, my mom didn't have time to discipline us. She was involved with living getting us food and getting us shelter. And I was, uh, I was kind of a wild kid. And so I didn't have a lot of discipline. And when I got there, I was, I was shell-shocked. Because there's, there's no way that you, that you get through boot camp at Paris Island without being a changed person. In what way did you feel they changed you? Uh, for the better? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden, I, I listened to people. You know, I would never listen to people before. I knew what was best for me. But you're, you're forced to listen because of where you're supposed to go in, in your service in the Marine Corps, which is protecting those Marines around you and protecting the life and liberty in America. Yeah. And in order to do that in the Marine Corps, it's instant obedience to command. Yeah. The Marine Corps is based on that. Did you meet guys from other parts of the country, other states? Uh, yeah. Southerners, uh, Westerners? You know, it was, it was interesting. I had never met anyone from anywhere else before. And I 
got friendly with some with some people from South Carolina, with some guys from South Carolina, who had an entirely different concept of the way life is supposed to run, as opposed to me. You know. Tell us about that. What was their belief in yours? Uh, they grew up that you know, what you did was you you grew up. You went to church, you went to school, you played on the football team, and then you joined the service. It was just a natural progression for them. And I found that the boys that I knew from Pennsylvania had the same kind of, of lifestyle training. That uh, you know, they progressed from high school on into the service, you know, and then, you know, that's that was the start of their life. You get you got into the Marine Corps to escape from something, to get out of Roxbury, as you said that 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 was the only way you could do it. Do you feel these other guys did the same thing, to get out of where they had come from, or was there more of a military tradition in their families? Was there a I think there? I think there was more of a military tradition in their community. Mm. And, and they felt, many of them felt that this was the right thing for them to do. And as I said before, this was their life progression. You know, they, went, uh, they went in the service, and then when they've completed the service to their country, then they start their life. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a good point. Tell us about, you took tests when you were at Paris Island to determine what you were gonna do in the Corps. That's correct. Do you remember any of these tests or, uh, did you have any druthers as to where you wanted to go and what you wanted to do? I never had an option. Uh, in the Marine Corps, the options for where, for where you go and what you do are predicated by your actions in boot camp and on the, the will of your drill instructors. They, have, they do their evaluations on you and they send you where they feel you'll do best. Did you ever sit with your DI or somebody else uh, and say, I'd like very much to go and be a mortar man or a machine gunner or a pilot or something? Never. Did you ever have that opportunity? Never. No. It was just they watched you, observed you, and decided. That's correct. Okay, you went, you went through all the close order drill and the rifle range and you got pretty good and you got to be a Marine. It was 13 weeks? Yes. So July or August, you're out of Paris Island? The end of August. End of August of 1964. And did you go home? Did you get to go home? We went to uh, Infantry Training Regiment in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. So you went right from PI down to Camp Lejeune? That's correct. With how many other guys that you knew? The whole platoon? With the whole platoon. The whole platoon, everybody goes to Infantry Training Regiment. Because all Marines, regardless of what their job is, we are all basic infantrymen. You are now at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and getting advanced infantry training, is that correct? That's correct. And again, is there anything you, any specialty that you would have liked to have picked up on at this time? Uh, it never, it it never entered my mind that I had an option. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you didn't, as you said before. I, uh, I did what they asked me to do. You know, I was happy that I could finally go somewhere to get a candy bar. Oh, you got to the PX. <laughs> well, no, we never got to the PX, but in the laundry area, they had a candy machine, and we were so happy to just have a candy bar. After, after Paris Island where you don't get anything. You sound like you were on a very tight leash all this time. They didn't let you go anywhere, did they? No, no. And did they talk about, um, did they talk about going to Vietnam? Is, was this the... It was never an issue. It, that, that was it? It was never brought up. Most of us didn't even know there was a Vietnam. Okay, and how long were you at, at Lejeune? I was at Lejeune for 30 days. Another 30 days. You're coming up to September of 64. That's correct. And 
What happened? Did you fall out one morning and they announced that uh, you were going to get on an airplane or a boat? No, or no. A bus? After after infantry training regiment at Camp Lejeune, we got 30 days leave. Good. We got to go home for 30 days, uh, and then we were told where our next duty station was and where we had to report. So you came home to see your mother That's and correct. your sister yeah. and people from uh, your old neighborhood, uh -huh. you know, all dressed up in your new spiffy marine uniform. That must have been a very a proud sight. moment for you. I was a sight. Yeah, a good looking marine. Okay, and what did they tell you about when you came back from leave? They said we're going to uh, the third Marine, the first Marine Division in Camp Pendleton, California, for advanced infantry training. And we all got on a C-130 and flew to California. From where? Out of Cherry Point, or where? out of Cherry Point? Yeah, North Carolina. We had to report back to Camp Lejeune. It was actually Camp Geiger. And uh, Roy Geiger. We were all Geiger Tigers. Yeah. And uh, then we got transported to Cherry Point and put on the C 130 and flown to uh, California. How many guys were uh, in the plane with you? You know, 100? 240. 240 people. And you landed where? We landed at El Toro. El Toro Marine Air Station. In Santa Ana. Yeah. And now, now you're in the big leagues because you're in the, the premier division of the United States Marine Corps, which must have made you feel pretty good. And you're getting it really advanced infantry training, and you're on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. So you knew you were about to go someplace. We knew we, knew we were going overseas. We knew we were going to Asia. Uh, we presumed that we were going to Okinawa which is ultimately where we ended up. Uh, but again, there was, no, there was no thought of conflict. There was no talk about it even. We never, we never thought that, many of us never thought, I don't know who did think that we were going to, to war. It never, it never entered anybody's head that you guys would be sent to Europe, for example, or South America. You knew you were Pacific bound. We, we, were going, we were going to rotate to Okinawa yeah. and relieve the battalion that was there. Did the United States Marine Corps prepare you? Did they ever sit down and say, we're going to take some classes on Oriental culture, or this is how the people of Vietnam live, or the people of Japan live? Did you ever get anything like that? No, no. We. Uh, we had our culture, and we weren't particularly concerned with, with the people on Okinawa, particularly the people on Okinawa because they had been hosts to Marine battalions since World War II. So they knew us better maybe than we knew us. When you went to Okinawa, did you go with more or less the same bunch of guys that you had come over with, uh, come to California with. You once we were in, once we were in California, yeah, we were put into battalions, put into companies, and from there we stayed together. So largely, the guys around you were not strangers to you. No, all right. No, they were all people I, that I knew. And you flew to Okinawa. Oh no, we took a ship. You took a ship. The really? General D. I. Sultan. And that, and that must have a, taken you forever. It was a transport. It yeah. took us five days to get to Hawaii, and then another seven days to get to Yokohama, and then another two days to get to Okinawa. And we were stationed at Camp Schwab, which is one of the two bases, one of the two marine bases, the other one being Hanson. Camp Schwab on Okinawa. Tell us about uh, you sailing over from Yokohama, and this island comes up out of the sea, and you knew historically that a lot had happened there during the Second World War. What were your feelings about arriving at this place? 
I was I was finally I was finally being filled with the Marine Corps tradition. We got a lot of that on the ship going over. You know, we spent uh, we spent endless time talking with the older with the older men, the guys that had been in in some of the conflicts back then, which were like Beirut, which was a big Marine conflict for us. Uh, there were and there were a few people that were still left over from the Korean conflict, but nobody from WW two. There were there were no World no. War two veterans then. I guess not. I guess they were a little old. That was forty five, and you're now in uh, almost up to sixty five. Twenty years uh, previous, no, they wouldn't be around. No, we just uh, we just missed them, but we had. Uh, we had some guys from the Korean conflict. Uh, what so. did they tell you? You talked about installation of Marine Corps history and the 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 background of the unit you were in. What mm. did they talk to you about? We were we were taking over. We were changing flags with the Third Battalion, Third Marines on Okinawa. And we were, we had been told what a historically brave unit the 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines were. All of their conflicts through Guadalcanal and Tarawa and Okinawa. And although these were, these were pretty much just words to, just places to a lot of us because a lot of the men were, were like me, were not very educated. But we knew you know, that the tradition of the Marine Corps had carried the 3rd Battalion to, to great victories. And we were now a part of that. So Guadalcanal <clears throat> or Tarawa or places like that it was more of a concept than a reality, but something that you, through these guys, began to feel that you were part of something really special. You know, all of a sudden, the John Wayne movie, The Sands of Iwo Jima, became the most important flick in the world. Yeah. That's very well said, very good. Uh, you okay, know, tell me what you did on Okinawa. We, uh, we did a lot of training. We did a lot of training uh, both in amphibious assault, which is coming in off, off a ship, either on a helicopter into a landing zone or coming in on a, uh, on a landing platform ship, an LPH. And uh, we were just we were taught the ways in which you secure a beach and how, how you're supposed to handle yourself and what your responsibilities are to the people around you. You'd been in the Corps, uh, what, not yet six months, is that right? Just about six months yeah. at that point. And at this point was, was, um, was your career kind of set that you knew what kind of weapon was what did you have at this time? I carried uh, I carried an M14. Yeah. And I carried uh, at that point I carried 3.5 rocket ammunition, which is about three feet long, maybe two and a half feet long, weighs uh, nine pounds a piece, and we would carry five of those rounds three white phosphorus rounds and two high explosive anti-tank rounds strapped to a backboard on our backs. So during these maneuvers where you're going ashore and learning how to go take a beach, um, was your role that of a rifleman? Were you to be a, a my role? My role at that point was an ammo carrier for the 3.5 inch rocket launcher. 
That was my primary role. I was I was a, I was an infantryman and a rifleman because we all are, mm -hmm. you know, and and you protect your area of operation. But my job was to make sure that when we got to a point where we needed to fire, I was there, and we had and we had the ammunition. You would bring up the ammunition to the guys who were firing the rockets. Correct. Yeah. How much does five rounds of that stuff weigh? About fifty pounds. So you're lugging 50 pounds on your back in addition to all the other gear? You must have been a pretty strong guy. I was, uh, I was about 140 pounds. I, was, uh, I wasn't particularly strong, but I was particularly dedicated. She's all right. <laughs> I guess I'm going to ask you uh, again about Vietnam. Was this any part of your future now or closer? That none, none, none. We had no idea. Okay. We had, we had no idea, and it was now, it's now February of, of 65. 65. And we have no idea. Did you hear from home? Did you hear from your family? Anybody back in Roxbury? Oh, nothing, nothing about that there was, that no, there was no, a no. conflict I mean, did, going were, on. Was there any contact oh, with yeah. your family? Oh, yeah. Oh, Mom. You get, you get mail call and I got, like I got that. mail and I got brownies from home. Mom <laughs> would always send brownies. Go, what was going on around you on Okinawa? There's all kinds of military bases, um, a great deal of activity. Did you see ships of the Navy? Did you see uh, airplanes over your head? What was it like? We did... We were so cloistered. We were at the far end of the island. Which end? Northern end toward Japan? The southern end. The southern end, okay. Uh, we were far away from, from Hansen, which was really the base of activity, uh, where the planes come in and all that. Uh, we were involved in amphibious assault. And that was what we were being trained to do. Uh, then they took us to the northern training area of Okinawa, in the NTA, uh, which is steep hills and deep gullies and jungle. And that's where you earned your stripe. Were you still a private at this time? Were you? I was you a get PFC. A, you got it. You did get a stripe there. All right. How long did you stay uh, doing this at Okinawa? We were there. I was there until early March of nineteen sixty-five. Sixty-five. Then, then did your life change significantly? What happened? Well, what happened was I got I got shot in the eye by a blank a blank cartridge uh, when we were assaulting a machine gun position and my eye was burned and they sent me to a forward advance party to Mount Fuji in Japan to get our battalion area squared away for cold weather training which was the next thing on our agenda as far as training went and so I was sent to Mount Fuji for 45 days waiting for the battalion uh, getting the tents set up, getting the fuel supply ready, those kinds of things. You were part of the advance party. I was the advance party. Up, yeah. and, and you were in Japan now. Yes, yes. What did you think of that? I thought it was very strange. I thought it was a very strange place. Uh, the people The people didn't didn't respond to us like the people in Okinawa did. The people to the people in Okinawa, we were we were the friendlies. You know, they knew who we were. Uh, Japan was was a very different area. It was very standoffish. The people were. You know, don't don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Hmm. And. Uh, 
And I found that at least disarming. And it was, it was kind of a cultural shock. Did you have much contact with the Japanese, or this is just when you were on liberty, or what? Just when we were on liberty. Just when we were on liberty. We, uh, we'd get a couple, of, uh, a couple of nights off every week. And we'd be able to take a Scotch cab, which is a small cab, into uh, the next city, which was uh, Gotemba. And the four of us, I had, I had good friends then, and we'd go to the same bar, <laughs> sit in the same booth, sit with the same bar girls, drink the same liquor. And, uh, and it was fine, it was our own little, little place, but walking, walking up the street to go to the bar was strange in that, in that people would just kind of look at you like, you know, what are you doing here? How, um, would you describe this as uh, hostility? It wasn't, it wasn't so much hostility, I don't think, as it was, you know, we don't want you here. They weren't being hostile, they were just being protective. Of their territory. Of their territory, exactly. Themselves, yeah. After 45 days, did your, uh, the rest of your outfit catch up with you? After 45 days, I received notice to report back to the unit. On Okinawa? Supposedly on Okinawa. Yeah. That we were, uh, we were being put on float which means the battalion is now in a ready position. I was flown by helicopter from Fort Hansen on Okinawa to the LPH Iwo Jima in the uh, South China Sea, where my battalion was. And we were on float, and that was the first time I had ever heard the word Vietnam was when I was on that ship. What did you hear about Vietnam? I heard that we were going to a place called Vietnam and there might be some action, there might not be some action. But we were going there to secure an area because the Navy wanted to build a uh, small jump airstrip there. And that was July. And uh, was this part of a briefing from your officers, or was this scuttlebutt? How did you hear about this? I heard, I heard about it at, at Cal first. You know, at scuttlebutt first, and then, you know, the Marine Corps chain of command. The officers talked to the officers. The officers then talked to the senior NCOs. The senior NCOs talked to the corporals, and the corporals talked to us. Yeah. And they say, "Here now, hear this, and you're going to Vietnam." Did you sail over to Vietnam? I take it we sailed. We yeah. sailed on the uh, on the landing platform helicopter ship Iwo Jima, with a with three squadrons of helicopters, and our battalion. You used it as a ferry, uh, just a place to. Uh, a way to get there. Exactly. You didn't serve anything on the ship. No, nope. all we did was duty. run laps on the deck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Iwo Jima, huh? That's a very famous name in the uh, First Marine Division or the Marine Corps. Tell us about arrival at uh, Vietnam. The night before we landed, at Chulai, we were issued live ammunition. And that was the first inkling that I ever had that this may be more than a live fire problem. Uh, we were all issued three magazines of ammunition and I was issued my five rocket rounds and I carried an extra bandolier of, of linked uh, machine gun ammunition 
for the uh, for the M60. That was the first time that we thought that there was that there was going to be that there could be any trouble. Mm. How did you get off the ship? Did you did it pull up to a dock or did you go ashore in? Uh, we went we went ashore in helicopters. Okay, you flew over to what? We landed in helicopters. We landed at Chulai. And there was a marine station set up there. We were the marine station. That was it. We were the first marine landing in at Chulai, which was May of '65, May 12th. So I was still 17 when I hit because I turned 18 the next day. You're 17 years old and you're in Vietnam with the United States Marine Corps and you're, as you put it, you're humping a lot of ammunition, carrying things on your back, you're armed. What did they tell you you were there for? To secure an area to build an airstrip. And this is what you did? This was our job secure the area enough so the CBs could come in and put a jump strip down there. Specifically, what did you do to help secure the area? Were you given an area to patrol with your... We, we uh, went, uh, each company went on patrol maybe every other day. Each company had ambushes almost every day. And uh, and then we got in the first major Marine Corps altercation with the Viet Cong, which was Operation Starlight. Tell us about that, would you? We had we had gone over to the Van Trong Peninsula, which was right next to Chulai, on patrol the day before. We being Kilo Company, my company. We came back and we saw nothing. There was no one there, as far as we knew. The next day, India Company went over. And India Company got blasted. All of a sudden, there, were, there was a regiment of VC regulars on that peninsula. And we had to bring the whole battalion to bear on them. It was, uh, it was called Operation Starlight. What that was the first time we lost a lot of men. What part did you play in this, Tony? Running behind my gunner making sure that he had ammunition. That's, that's all I did. Fire into tree lines, move forward, fire into tree lines, move forward. We finally, the battalion finally ended up getting the VC regiment, as far as we knew, to the end of the peninsula where Navy gunfire blew off the end of the peninsula and hopefully took them with them. Could you actually see the people you were engaged with? No. You're just firing at tree lines knowing they're there. They back off and you That's That's that. where the last fire came from. You fire into the, where the last fire came from. At any point did you ever see a, uh, the guys you were fighting? Bodies. Just their bodies. We, you'd see dead bodies, but you never you never face to face with a man. You spoke of running behind your gunner. Uh, did you not yourself uh, fire anything? Oh, I was I was firing all the time. We had by that time we had we had slung our M14s so that the strap would sit opposite the way it normally would on a weapon, so that you could hold it off your shoulder and fire from the hip. Because when you were carrying that, that much other ammunition, you had to be able to just to drop down and pull a, pull around out 
and you could do that easier, and you could fire your weapon easier, your M14, if you were firing from the hip. And you're carrying bandoliers for yourself or for somebody else? I was carrying bandoliers for the M60 machine guns at that point, also. What other units were around you, do you know? Or, or do you concentrate very heavily on what you're doing? All I knew was that the only outfit I knew was there was us. Later I found out that there were other units there. The, the 9th Marines were there, the 7th Marines were there. But we didn't know that at the time. You spoke a minute ago about backing these guys off to the edge of a peninsula where Navy gunfire uh, operated against them. Uh, how about air cover? Did you have anything like that? We had, we had air cover from the gunships from uh, the Iwo Jima. I assume it was from the Iwo Jima. I'm not sure where they were from. Uh, and we did, have, uh, we did have some fire coming in, some friendly fire coming in from, uh, from artillery, which I'm not sure where that was. Because artillery can fire you know, 20 miles. I'm not sure where they were. We didn't have we didn't have close close air support from uh, from the jets at that point. This is getting to be summer, right in Vietnam. You're May, June, something like that. It's July. Tell us about the weather. It was uh, it was about 130 most of the time. 120, 130. You carried uh, you carried two canteens with you all the time on your cartridge belt, along with four magazines and your first aid pack. Uh, and you always were drinking. You had halazone tablets, so that when you ran out of water, you could take it out of a rice paddy and put the halazone tablets in. Water tasted lousy, but at least it wasn't going to kill you if you had the halazone tablets in it. Do you feel you were properly clothed and armed for what you were up against and where you were? Uh, we definitely, we weren't clothed properly. We had, uh, at that point, we still had the heavy cotton fatigues with long sleeves and you know, we just we just sweated, but they didn't have the the camouflage, the new camouflage fatigues that came later, or the M16s, which came later. We had the old heavy M14s, which yeah. was, but it was a banner weapon. You, know, you could you could pull yourself soaking wet out of a rice paddy with a soaking wet weapon, and that weapon would still fire. You spoke of going through Paris Island, Camp Lejeune, um, Pendleton. Um, do you feel you were well trained for what the situation you found yourself in? Absolutely. That they'd given you good preparation? Absolutely. How about the, uh, your officers, the quality of the leadership you experienced? They were the best. They were the best. These were, these were young men that That had the heart to be able to be able to to pull a group of men together, to pull a group of guys together, boys, and get a job done. And I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen that when I was growing up. There was never a person that took charge. We were all kind of individual agents. And it was, uh, it was different being part of a group. You're 18 years old and you're standing in a place called Vietnam that you hadn't even heard of several months before that. What's your feeling? Somebody shooting at you that you don't even know and you're shooting back. Can you tell us what it's like to go through an experience like that? I lost the first man killed was my friend Dixie Murphy. 
He was the first man killed at Chulai. And he was one of my best friends from Rome, Georgia. And all of a sudden, this is for real. Yeah. I had heard that people got killed up around the Nang. I had heard that people got killed down south, down, in, down around Saigon. When Dixie died, our unit, our unit became a real Marine fighting unit and knew that we were in it for the hall now. Were you yourself at any time wounded? In, the, in your experiences in uh, Vietnam? No. Other men who were wounded, uh, are you aware of what kind of medical treatment did they get? The best. Were they taken off the field immediately, sent back to a mash? They were sent back, uh, they were put on, uh, on medevac choppers. We had chop choppers would fly out in the middle of a firefight and we'd throw smoke out and they'd land and then take the men off and take them back to Chulai or Da Nang East or whatever medical center. Did you ever see guys again after they were hit? No. That was the end of it. How much of this did you personally go through, Tony? Does this go on endlessly, one engagement after another? We were, we were in, in combat. Pretty much the whole time I was there. And how long was that? That was 10 months. So every day was pretty much like the day before. If every, if every day, if you weren't fighting every day, there was always the chance that you could be fighting every day. And it was always in your head, you know, because we went on patrols every day after that. Once, once we got in, in a position where we needed to really defend our position and we had an enemy, everything shifted into high gear. You went on sweeping clears every day, you went on ambushes every night, and you went on patrols, and you swept through villages, and you might not get hit every time you crossed a rice paddy. But you got hit often enough so that it was always there. You mean fired upon? Exactly. I'm not sure what to ask you here, except that I simply cannot imagine if you're out at night getting fired at and, and afraid and being threatened, and you go through it all day long, does it occur to you that you're never going to get out of here? Never. What made you think you were going to get out of there? You never thought about it. You saw it around you, and you knew it existed, but it, it wasn't a reality for me. Can you explain that? It, it sounds like um, a massive denial of your situation. I never, I never really had time to think about it. We never had time to think about it. I'm sure guys did. Mm. You know, there were some, there were some older sergeants walking around with big black circles under their eyes. You know, they knew what it was about. But you know, we were 18. We were immortal. Yeah, that's right. When you went into this situation, uh, was the rule in effect that you'd be out of there in a year? Or was there any end line for you? There was the end of, there was the end of your 13-month of your tour when they rotated you back. And you knew that from Camp Pendleton. You know, that, that third battalion, third Marines, was going to be in Okinawa 
in the Far East for 13 months. So you knew at the end of that 13 months you were coming home. Oh, so your Okinawa time also counted on your exactly. rotations. Okay. Exactly. That's why we, we didn't do the full 13 in Vietnam. Let's put that question in another light then. Did you look forward to the end of that 13 months? Did you know that sometime this was going to end? It's called getting short. Yeah. And it happens Nobody's to everybody. Nobody wants to get shot then. You know, you, you get short and then you're counting days. You know? I got, uh, I've got two months and a wake up. You know? I've got, I've got 30 days and a wake up. I've got two weeks and a wake up. You know? And you know, when you wake up, you're going home. You're going back to the world. You said you were there 10 months. Uh, is that totally in, in Vietnam? That's on float going there and, and there. I was there from May of 65 to February 6th of 66. What happened on February 5th that you got out of there? February 5th we were on patrol. February 5th, we were in an area south of Da Nang, doing sweeps, sitting in ambush that night. February 6th came, commander came down, lieutenant said, roll it up, get your gear together, get on the mule, a flatbed, four-wheel drive vehicle, you're going home. That was February 6th. I got on the aircraft that night. We were still eating sea rations. We flew from Da Nang to Guam, to Hickam in Hawaii, to El Toro, and got off the plane. It was Friday night. Uh, I was back in the States. And I still had, I still had Vietnam under my fingernails. That's a pretty abrupt transition. While you were there and caught up right in the middle of this whole thing, did you feel you were in a huge war, or was the whole thing within 50 feet of you? That's all you worried about. Did you know what was going down in Saigon? Did you know what was going on north of you or west of you? Or, or did we you had, look out we for had where so you were? Little, we had so little knowledge of what was going on around us that one time after we had been in a particularly bad firefight, and we had lost a lot of guys. And I came home and wrote to my mom. And the basic premise of, of the note was, you know, look, I don't care that I'm here, you know. I don't care that we're doing what we're doing, you know. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But how come nobody else cares that this is what we're doing? And as I said, mom was a homemaker for some, for some families in Brookline. She gave this letter to the woman that she worked for. The woman she worked for gave it to somebody she knew at the Globe. And the Globe wrote it, ran it on the front page. And Your letter? My letter, September 30th, 65. For you to write a letter like that, how did you know nobody else cared? Or what made you think nobody else cared? You never got news from home. Like, Starlight was a big battle. It was a big Marine battle for us. It was a big victory for us. We never heard anything about it. We never heard anything about the guys that, that were dying at Da Nang. You know, if somebody knows about it, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna write to us. You, know? you got no feedback. 
Never. Never. So I assumed that nobody knew that we were there. You know, and if nobody knows that we're here, then why are we here? Did your mother tell you your uh, letter had run on the front page of the Globe? When I came home? Yeah. When I came home. Uh, when I came home, you know, I got, I got letters from, from other people, from people I had gone to, to grade school with and stuff. You know. What happened after you got home? Uh, how long did you stay in the Corps? I stayed in the Corps uh, a total of three and a half years, so I was another, I was another year and a half in the Marine Corps. I spent uh, eight months in Quantico, Virginia, and then eight months at Marine Barracks and Charleston Naval Shipyard in Boston. What did you do at Quantico? That's the officer's training school. That's that was the Marine Corps West Point, as it were. What, was you, what were you doing? Uh, I was working with a lot of weapons at that point. Uh, I was doing a lot of 3.5 instruction. Uh, the Army calls them bazookas. Washing dishes, cleaning weapons. Being a Marine. It was, <laughs> it was life goes on. Yeah. You know? And then you went to the Charlestown Navy Yard? Yes. And what did you do there? I was a gate guard. I was a gate guard. I had to, I had to, uh, I had to advance my enlistment. I had to uh, volunteer for an extra three months duty to, to come out, to come back home. But my buddy Joe was up here as a sergeant and, mm. and uh, he's a hero. When you were back in, in the States winding down your career, you knew you were going to get out pretty soon, I assume. Uh, was the Vietnam War still in effect or? Oh yeah. Oh. All right. What did you hear about it and what did you think about it? We heard everything about it because we had people in and out all the time. They were either going there or coming from there. So you had good first-hand communications? Oh sure. Yeah. Oh sure. What did you think about the protests against the war or uh, any part of the American psyche at that time? Didn't think, didn't think much about it. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot going on at that point. Uh, Sixty-seven. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of interest in it one way or the other. You know, uh, it's, it's over there, and yeah. you know, in sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy. But when people started becoming aware, it was a different structure. You you got out in in what year, Tony? December of sixty-seven. December of sixty-seven. Tell us about uh, your last day in the Corps. I I had come out of uh, Charlestown, the Chelsea Naval Hospital. I had been there for, for quite some time. I had been in a, in a car wreck with another fellow. In a car wreck? In a car wreck. Uh, we both got Great. promoted. Both got promoted the same, the same time, and we decided we were going to Rockingham. And celebrate. And celebrate. And, uh, so now you're a corporal. Lance Corporal. Lance Corporal. Good for you. And uh, he was a corporal. Denny Secorso from uh, East Boston. And Denny was driving 58 Ford. We were going up uh, 91, 93, and uh, hit the brick abutment at Daskin Road and went through it and fell down that 30, 40 feet into the roadway below and got hit by another car and Denny got killed. And I was comatose in the hospital for a long time. And uh, my mom was living in Revere then. And she would work all day and then take the bus to Chelsea and then walk up that long hill 
yeah. up to the Naval Hospital every single night. Finally, one of her friends went with her, one of the other neighborhood mothers, and they got to the bottom of the hill, and the other mother looked at my mother and said, you walk up this every day? What are you, crazy? And she stuck out her thumb, and of course the first guy that pulled by stopped and picked him up and drove him up there. You know? <laughs> Never occurred to my mother to do that. To hitchhike. <laughs> Never occurred to her. Uh, I got out. I went home. I went to Revere. My mom had moved to Revere at that point. And uh, sat down on the bed and what do I do now? You feel pretty much alone, don't you? Well, you're, you're, you're all by yourself. Yeah. You're all by yourself. Yeah. When, I, when I first came home from Vietnam, I was sitting on the, on the streets, on the sidewalk in Terry Street in Roxbury where I grew up, and kids would come by that I grew up with and say, hey, where you been? Haven't seen you in a while. What's up? What are you going to say to them? What did you say to them? I'm in the car. That's all. You were in the, probably the, the best and the most elite outfit in the Corps. Did anybody ever appreciate that? Uh, that what you had done, you did with the best? Nobody that wasn't there. People didn't know. <clears throat> okay, you were out of the Marine Corps. Uh, it's this December 67, is that right? Yes, sir. What did you do then? What did you do with your life? I... I couldn't see because I had been hit. Uh, I hit my head during the accident and I had double vision. And uh, they discharged me anyway, so I went to the doctor and they gave me a 10% disability. And I got a job doing gas leakage survey work for a company that does it around the country. And I ended up going to Michigan to do gas leakage survey work in New Jersey and all over the place for about six months. And then I came home. I got tired of it. I, I was away. I had been away too long. I was tired of being away. I could, uh, I could get a job closer to home, help mom out, you know, see my buddies. So I came home. And uh, I came home on May 10th and went to Suffolk Downs Racetrack. And that's where I met the mother of my daughter. It was that day. And life was never the same after that. <laughs> that's a nice thing to say. Did you take advantage of? Uh Anything offered by the VA, such as uh, schooling? I had, uh, I had originally started uh, some light coursework because I had gotten my GED while I was at Quantico, while I was in the Marine Corps. So I was eligible for, uh, for college training. And I did take advantage of the GI Bill for about a year, but that was 1970, and that was the strike year for all colleges. They all went out on strike to protest the war. And that's when I left college again. I left school again and just went to work in the insurance business, and hustling insurance, and trying to make a life. And I got called in for a reevaluation of my disability. 
1973 and the psychiatrist asked me what was going on and we talked for a long time. That was on the old Court Street office. And I left and I didn't think much more about it. And then two weeks later I got a notice from the government that my disability had been increased to 30 percent and I was now eligible for vocational rehabilitation. And I went into government center and took a battery of tests and I went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst where I graduated in 76. What did you study there, Tony? Business. I, had, I got a Bachelor of Science in Business. Let's do this. Let's fast forward now to where we started or go back to the beginning. When we first talked before this tape, I learned that you've written a book about your experiences in the Corps. Would you tell us something about that? I think it's re a remarkable thing to have done, but tell us about the book. It's, uh, it's a compilation of 14 short stories. Uh, and these, these aren't stories that I heard from somebody else. These are stories that either I was there and I was the one it was happening to or it happened to one of my best friends and I know it because I know I found out how he died or how they died. Tell us the name of the book. The name of the book is My Private Vietnam, 14 short stories by a Marine Ammo Humper. A Marine Ammo Humper. That's wonderful. That's what I, that was my job. Tell us one of these stories, any one. I had a friend, Dave Nye, who uh, was a Lance Corporal, good Marine. He made Lance Corporal before I made PFC. That's how good this guy was. He was, he was the first at everything he did. He was the first person to put in charge of, of a squad. He was the first guy out on ambushes. He and I had not only been with each other since boot camp, but when we went to, when I went to Fuji, they sent him to Fuji, so we were together there too. And he was my best buddy. But he was a great Marine. Not like me at all. <laughs> he was very squared away. And in Vietnam, when the first R&Rs came down, they gave them to the best Marines. These were prime R&Rs. These were places like Bangkok and Honolulu and Hong Kong. And they gave Davy his choice of where he wanted to go. And they gave him the first R and R to Hong Kong. When after he did his R and R in Hong Kong, he was flying out, and his plane crashed, and they were all killed. He only died because he was so good. If he hadn't been the best Marine. He wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have been there. Yeah. And he was the second guy from our outfit that got killed. Dixie Murphy was the first. In the space of, of a month, I lost maybe the two best friends I had in the Corps. Okay, now let's go back to the other thing we talked about at the beginning. You were living here in Natick, and you woke up one night with flashbacks? It's a flashback. I was, uh, I was in my house, except I was on patrol and I was gonna kill people. And somebody called the police, somebody called the native police. 
And then the police came in and asked me my name. I told them my name. They asked me what was going on. I said, I don't know. They said, well, why don't you get in the squad car with us? And in the half a mile between my place and the police station, they had found out that I was a former Marine, that I was disabled, that I was having a flashback right then, and they found out where to take me. And they took me to Brockton, and they put me up on a locked ward up in Brockton. Did either of these cops um, understand immediately a flashback? I think they did. I think they did. So had, do you know if they'd been in the service? More than likely. Yeah. I More asked than you, likely. I asked you earlier if you'd been wounded in battle, and you said no. Can you look at it from another perspective that um, years later you wake up in a house in Natick and you think you're in Vietnam or in a terrible situation. In a sense, you were wounded, weren't you? We all were. We all were. There wasn't a Marine that went to Vietnam that didn't come back living everything he did over there yeah. every day, you know? And, and it doesn't, it's not constant, it's not a constant thing every day, but at one point during every day of your life, you think about what happened. It may be only, only an instant. You remember someone's name or you remember a bush or something, a hole the French bunker at the north end of Da Nang airstrip. But it's every single day. Do you meet with guys, do you have reunions from your outfit? My outfits have reunions. Do you go to them? I don't go. Do you talk to people who uh, have gone through the same things you've gone through? No. I don't read books. On, on Vietnam. I don't see movies on Vietnam. I won't watch television programs. Uh, I just, I can't do it. I just can't do it. You're wearing a shirt with the helicopter from Miss Saigon on it. Is that correct? That's right. Why? It was given to me by a dear friend of mine who helped me write the book, and she had gone to see the play and brought this back for me. In all the experience that you had uh, in the Corps and or uh, Vietnam, is there a most memorable character that uh, comes to mind more often than not. Sure, sure. My sergeant. And who was he? Sergeant Irving Chakaratis. Chakaratis? Chakaratis, a big Greek guy with an enormous handlebar mustache. Uh, a veteran of Beirut. The guts of the Corps. He was the man. He was always the man. Did he make it out of Nam? Yeah. And are you in touch today? No, I, last time I saw him was 1966, late summer at Quantico. He was driving past me and he stopped. Really? Yeah. You bumped into each other there? And said, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> After all you've been through, I hate to ask you this, but was there a most humorous experience that you can recall? Oh, sure. sure. Tell us about that. They gave us liberty once at Da Nang. 
and they, they, a whole group of us went off at one time. Uh, they send the sergeants out first, you know, and then they get an extra couple of hours, and then we go out after them. And from what I understand, Chakaratis and this other sergeant went into this bar where they were all Air Force guys. And Chakaratis bet everybody in the bar that he could drink one of the old Knickerbocker beer glasses full of Southern Comfort <laughs> and walk out. A walk out, yeah, right. And, Crawling uh, doesn't count. <laughs> but the only way he would do that was if everybody put their money on the bar, he would cover all the bets. And the deal was that he had to walk around and pick up all the money and walk out after he drank. Air Force was more than willing to take him on. Lots of money on the bar. Chakaratis just opened his throat and threw it back, put it down. He and Sergeant Hicks, he walked around the bar, picked up all the money, walked out, started staggering, I guess, when he started to cross the street. And Sergeant Hicks grabbed him and threw him in a skosh cab. And they took off down the street. And that was the end of that. Except Corporal Murphy and Lance Corporal Many Hawks went into the same bar about an hour later and said, We'll bet anybody here we can drink a <laughs> Knickerbocker glass <laughs> right. full of Southern Comfort. And the MPs brought them back to the base. And right. <laughs> many Harsh just went to sleep, but Murphy had to go get his eye fixed. <laughs> the Air Force, he just tore into them. Yeah, I suspect they were not <laughs> too well received. <laughs> when and where were you discharged? I forgot to ask you that. Uh, Charleston Naval Shipyard. Okay, and what was the date? December 8th. December 8th. 1967. And with what rank and... Uh, Lance Corporal. And Decker medals that you'd gotten? Navy Commendation, uh, Good Conduct, Vietnamese Service, Armed Force Expeditionary. That's it. That's, that's more than enough. Did you join any, any reserve unit when you came home or have you had it with no. the, the Corps? Did you join any veterans organizations? Are you a member of one now? I'm a member of a lot of them now. Uh, the Third Marine Division Association. I'm a life member of the DAV. I'm a life member of the First Marine Division Association. That's good credentials. That's good to have. They're my guys. Go ahead. They're my guys. They're my guys. That's right. You, you, you have a, a good alumni association there. How important to you was serving in the military, Tony? It was the most important thing I've ever done in my life, save for fathering a child. Your daughter. Yeah. When you came home, uh, did you discuss uh, with your family or friends what you had done, what you'd seen in the service? No. And you've not done that with anybody since? No. Why are you here today? I finally came to grips with all that I remember in maybe 97, 96, 97. And uh, these were heroic men. Mm -hmm. These guys, these guys died and people just don't know, people just don't understand what, what it's like for an 18 year old to go through a life and death situation for a prolonged period of time and the kind of intestinal fortitude that takes. 
Uh, people need to understand the sacrifice that those guys made. And we're all going, you know. We're all going to die. And to, to know what I know and to understand what I now understand and to have not related that information to other people. That would be a great loss, wouldn't it? You know, I, then I, I wouldn't have really done what I was supposed to do. Yeah, you know? I, th I think if you God spared me here. for a reason. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Looking back uh, and historically, uh, do you feel there was a, a difference in the way people received Vietnam veterans coming home than, say, from uh, WW2 or oh, Korea? Certainly, absolutely. And why is that? First thing, they didn't know that there was a war going on for a long time. It was, it was never written up. You know. uh, and then the stories that they got were corrupt, were not legitimate references to the kinds of things that were happening in Vietnam. You know. If one person blows up a hut that we received friendly fire from, or we received fire from, and there happened to be civilians in there that got killed, that's what they wrote about. You know, they didn't write about Dixie Murphy who got cut in half by, and by a machine gun while he was on an ambush. You know, they didn't write about the valor of, of Lieutenant Watt over in Starlight when he was standing up on top of the, uh, the Amtrak telling people to shift their fire to get better cover for his men. You know, they talked about somebody killed a baby. You know, and God bless them, I feel bad about that too. But that wasn't all we did. I mean, I was just, I was a ship bum ammo humper. That's all I was. But we did more than, the, than they gave us credit for then. Above all, is there any one incident that we haven't covered here today? And, and let me say how much we appreciate your coming and to put this on the record. It's extremely valuable and uh, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing here today. But is there anything I haven't asked you that you feel you'd like to get on the record before we wind up here? Well, first, let me say that I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to say the kinds of things that I've said about the kinds of men that I was with. Yeah. These were these were young men thrown into strange, frightening situations. And they wore it well. They served our country well. And you know, a thank you is all they need. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your being here. Semper Fi.